Greetings and welcome to this new season of the virtual lecture series in collaboration with the University of California, Santa Barbara's Iranian Studies Initiative. I am Ali Reza Ardakani, Executive Director of Fahang Foundation. We are a member-supported, non-political, non-religious, not-for-profit organization with the sole mission to celebrate and promote Iranian art and culture for the benefit of the community at large. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Katerina Clark of Yale University for a Persian poet in Stalin's Russia, Abul Qasim Lahuti in Tajikistan. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Janet Afari of the Iranian Studies Initiative at the University of California. She is the director of the program at Santa Barbara, and we invite her to say a few words. Good morning, Dr. Afari. Welcome. Good morning, uh, Mr. Adekani, appreciate it. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the first talk in our lecture series this year. We have invited several distinguished speakers from the United States, the Netherlands, the Georgian Republic, and Turkey to present their latest research. Our focus this year on, is on the artistic and literary exchanges between Iran, South Caucasus, Central Asia, and Russia in the 20th century especially the contribution of Iranian diasporic communities. The lectures will continue through May of 2022 as we look at several subjects. Among them, the role of Mirza Fatelia Ahunzade of Tiflis, who lived in the middle of the 19th century and became the founder of Azerbaijani and Iranian Enlightenment, a theater of enlightenment which began as a vehicle of education and gender emancipation, among Azerbaijani speakers of South Caucasus in the 1890s, then gradually spread to the Iranian Caspian Sea region in the first decade of the 20th century. The remarkable influence of Azerbaijani intellectuals of Tiflis and Baku on the Iranian constitutional revolution of 1906-11, and the flourishing of Persian literature in Tajikistan under communist Russia in the 1920s and 1930s, a literary movement initiated by Iranian dissidents. I'd like to express our thanks to the co-organizers of our series, the Graduate Center for Literary Research at UC Santa Barbara, the Geramian Embrani Foundation, and the Farhang Foundation, especially Ali Reza Ardekani. Our speaker today is Dr. Katrina Clark from Yale University. She'll be introduced by Dr. Sven Speaker, Professor of Germanic and Slavic Studies at UC Santa Barbara. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janet and um, Ali Reza. Um, I'm happy to introduce Katharina Clark. Professor Katharina Clark is the Benzinger Professor of Comparative Literature and of Slavic Languages and Literatures at Yale University. Um, Professor Clark has taught at SUNY Buffalo, uh, Wesleyan University, the University of Texas at Austin, Indiana University, and UC Berkeley. Her research focuses on Russian, European, and Eurasian film, literature, performing arts, art, architecture, and literary theory, um, but also on cultural interactions, world literature, and art and ideology. A lot of emphasis in her research is on the interwar years um, between the First and the Second World War, that is the 1930s, and on efforts to create methods of understanding that operate from the margins or that seek to shed light on canonical writers and artists from angles that bypass or relativize the Western centers of cultural production. Clark is the author of three highly influential monographs. The first was the Soviet novel, History as Ritual, which came out in 1981. Now, this book is a dynamic account of the socialist realist novel's evolution as seen in the context of Soviet culture that has become a classic for anyone interested in taking the evolution and analysis of Soviet culture seriously. The second book was a work on the Russian philosopher Mikhail Bakhtin that was co-authored with the late Michael Holquist in 1984. It's been translated into several European and non-European languages. The third book was entitled Petersburg Crucible of Cultural Revolution from 1995. And in this book, Clark follows the quest of Russian intellectuals in the years 1913 to 1931 
to live the Bolshevik revolution, a focus that also casts new light on the formation of Stalinism. The study focuses on the complex relations between the extraordinary environment of the 1917 Bolshevik revolution, the aspirations and dreams of politicians and intellectuals, and the local cultural system, as well as the broader arena of contemporary European and American culture. The next book was entitled Moscow, the Fourth Rome, Stalinism, Cosmopolitanism, and the Evolution of Soviet Culture, 1931 to 1941. In this book, which came out in 2011, Clark provides an interpretative cultural history of the city of Moscow during the 1930s, the decade of the great purges. And she sheds light on this most Stalinist of periods. In her account, the decade emerges as an important moment in the prehistory of key concepts in literary and cultural studies today, transnational nationalism, cosmopolitanism, and world literature. And the final uh, study uh, authored by Professor Clark, entitled Eurasia Without Borders, Leftist Internationalists and Their Cultural Interactions, 1917 to 1943, has just been released. In this book, Clark looks at attempts in those decades to found a kind of socialist global commons, meaning a far-flung community of people committed to a single cause and engaged in discussions, lobbying and writing or filmmaking aimed at working to generate a Marxist perspective on the world. The book looks at the interactions between during the interwar years of European culture producers with their counterparts in different parts of Asia, principally in Turkey, Persia, Afghanistan, Northern India, China, Japan, and Mongolia. The book, as far as I can tell, is the latest episode in Clark's long-standing interest in revisionist cultural histories that operate methodologically from and with the margins, this time with a considerably broadened geocultural focus. And with this, I'd like to pass it on to Professor Clark. Welcome and thank you. Well, first, I'd like to thank the Iranian Initiative at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the Pahang Foundation for inviting me to address you all. Truly a great honor. But then I have to start with a disclaimer. In addressing an audience that includes scholars from, of Iran, I feel something of an imposter. I do not know Farsi, so please forgive me when I mispronounce Persian words. And I could never pretend to be an authority on Persian literature. Rather, I've come to my topic from the Russian side, using Russian sources. All my readings of the text in Farsi and Tajiki are derived from English or Russian translations, a great limitation, I freely admit. Nevertheless, I feel my perspective on the Houthi has something to offer those unfamiliar with his Soviet milieu. And I anticipate that I'll benefit from the discussion, in the discussion from the insights of those better versed in things Iranian than I am. In that hope, I plunge forward. The famous Russian writer and leftist, Vaksim Gorky, in his keynote address to the first Congress of the Soviet Writers' Union in 1934, insisted that Soviet literature for all its variety, quotes, must be organized as a unified and collective whole. To achieve such a homogeneity would be a truly ambitious undertaking. Most of the Soviet minority uh, literatures were generically very unlike the Russian, from which mainstream Soviet literature was clearly emerging. Many of them were primarily oral, a situation compounded by the fact that the minority popular peoples were largely literate. Allegedly, in the area which became Tajikistan, for example, the population was only 0.5% literate at the time of the revolution. But something more than aggressive literary campaigns in the republics was needed to form a single literature out of the, out of the disparate traditions. Earlier, in 1925, Stalin had provided guidelines for how a single Soviet literature might be limited, might be formed. In a speech to the Communist University of the Tallest of the East in Moscow, he declared that the new Soviet literature would be, quotes, proletarian in content and national in form, a formula he revised in the speech of 1930 to socialist in content and national in form. One might presuppose the Stalin de facto sought to privilege content over form, as it were, let the minority peoples keep their quaint forms as a mere shell, so long as this content is acceptable. It's not entirely clear to me, however, part to the formalists, how you disaggregate form and content. Our attacks, current motifs, for example, part of form or of content. 
and how might Soviet writers meld in temporary revolutionary content with national forms, which so often had come down from ancient times and were inflected by a feudal mentality and its superstitions, as was often pointed out at the time. Furthermore, forms are not inert empty vessels into which one can pour content. There is a dynamic inter interaction between the two and forms are not semantically neutral and can be subject to contested interpretations. As Michael Holquist has pointed out in expl explicating Bakhtin quotes, features are never purely formal, for each has associated with it a set of distinctive values and three suppositions. Today, I hope to demonstrate using the example of the Persian poet Abu Qasim Lakhati and his Soviet writings, that the historical context plays a critical role in determining these quotes, values and three suppositions, which are not um, stable in consequence. Lakhati's Soviet poems were lauded in official criticism of the 1930s as a model for how Stalin's 1925 dictum could be implemented as a, in practice. But the lionization of Lakhati then did not last. The story of his career illustrates the extent to which form is not abstract or neutral, not a shell or a vessel, but has its own interpretive frames and, and imputed literary, uh, imputed history that is subject to, to contestation. But first, some background on Lahuti. Lahuti and his dates are from 1887 to 1957, a poet and activist had in his youth campaigned against the, the Pahlavi regime, sub, subservient to foreign occupiers, and also was the supporter of the downtrodden. His political views put him in a precarious position several times, and he had had to flee to Istanbul, then a mecca for nonconformist intellectuals from Islamic countries. 1921 found him in Istanbul, but the establishment of a revolutionary enclave in Gilan in, in Persia enticed him to return and join the fray. By the time he arrived, the rebel government had been routed in Gilan, but on February the 2nd, 1922, he became head of another uprising in Tabriz. After a bloody battle, the uprising was crushed. Many were executed, but Lahuti, a price on his head, together with a large contingent of his comrades, managed to escape, fleeing on horseback across the frontier into Soviet Azerbaijan, the only viable escape route. Other members of his party were pardoned by Persia, but he was not. And he continued on to Moscow, where he studied from 1924 to 1925 at the already mentioned Communist University of Tolis of the East, an institution that trained future cadres and was at the time a hotbed of communist internationalism. In that environment, Lahuti's anti-imperialist convictions and concerns for the poor morphed into a communist commitment to communism, and he joined the party in 1924. By the 1930s, he had been elevated to the Soviet literary elite. Foreign students at KUTV were on, on finishing their studies assigned to by the Comintern or the party generally for work in their, his home country. But Lahuti could not return to his. And in 1925, he was sent to Dushanbe, called Salinabad from 1929 to 1961, the capital of Tajikistan, where the language uh, um, Tajiki is close to his native Farsi. There he headed a number of party and government bodies, principally in education and culture. When Lahuti arrived in 1925, Tajikistan had only rudimentary provisions for its culture. The traditional centers of Tajik culture, such as Bukhara and Samarkand, having been apportioned to Uzbekistan when the Tajikistan became an autonomous territory within the new republic in 1924 and a separate republic in 1929. Lahuti worked tirelessly to overcome the cultural deficiencies, at one point even transporting a printing press to Dushanbe on his back so the publishing house, so the publishing house could be formed there. In Tajikistan, Lahuti continued to work in literature too, though, the, though his efforts were repeatedly stymied by the proletarian writers group, VUP, the All Union Association of Proletarian Writers, a rising power in European Russia and in Central Asia too. The militant VUP leadership espoused a somewhat conservative and highly Russo-centric aesthetic, citing as the literary models the great realists of the 19th century and Tolstoy in particular. The Central Asian counterparts regarded the Persianate tradition as feudal and retrograde. The campaign for Central Asians to write a la Tolstoy hardly met Stalin's demand for literature national in form, but that time there was this, um, this was no matter because they had some strong side of party support. Lahuti's ideas for a new literature in Tajikistan was at odds with those of VAP, 
the international orientation of his favored the transnational Persianate tradition as a source for a new Tajik literature, effectively rather than the European or narrowly Russian. In his speeches uh, to the first Congress of the Soviet Writers' Union in 1934, he recommended the Tajik writers draw on, quotes, the great Persian poets who wrote in the language of the Tajiks, naming such classical poets of the 9th to 10th, 12th, 11th centuries as Ferdowsi, Saji, Hafiz, and Om Khayyam. Clearly, by the time of the Writers' Congress, Lahuti's fortunes in the literary world had improved. The political landscape in Soviet literature was changing rapidly, especially in 1932. That year, a single union of Soviet writers was established by the Politburo, by Politburo decree, and in the same de decree, BAP was dismantled explicitly. As in the 1932, all right, Soviet writers were integrated into um, the one writers' union, they needed representatives from the Asian republics and fastened on Lahuti in particular, who came to serve as the representative, not just of Tajikistan, but of Central Asia generally. Lahuti was able to relinquish his, his roles in the Tajik government, Taj, government of Tajikistan and concentrate on his literary career. Then when in 1933, the Union of Tajik Writers was formed, Lahuti was made its honorary president. But soon he was assuming a leading role in the administration of literature in the entire Soviet Union. Already in that same year, when a commission was formed to work on questions of foreign literature for the forthcoming Writers' Union Congress, Lahuti was appointed as representative for all the East. And in, this, in the aftermath of the Writers' Congress, he was appointed to the Writers' Union Presidium and Secretariat, becoming the third most powerful member of that body. Given his public success, one is bound to ask to what extent Lakuti functioned in this decade as an afflatus of Stalinism. Potentially, a prime example of this would be his 1932 poem, The Gardener, that appeared in Russian translation with the title, To the Leader, to the Comrade, to Stalin. In this poem, Stalin is likened to a wise old gardener who lovingly tends his vines, bringing such prosperity to the happy people that they sing a, quotes, triumphant hymn to him. But then one day, a quote, fervent young man happens to, to his horror to see the gardener cut out one of the vines that was strong and provided support for other vines. He remonstrates with the gardener, who explains that though this vine had been strong and useful in its time, now it had come to hinder the other vines from growing strong by blocking their access to the sun and sucking up the moisture. One cannot see all the harm the recalcitrant vine is causing because much of that is under the ground. In case the reader did not get the point, Lahuti added here the term under the mask, a mainstay of purge rhetoric, of the rhetoric of the Soviet purges. Little shoots keep coming up from that evil plant, but cutting them off is to no avail. So the rapacious vine had to be cut out at its roots. In the final section of the poem, Lahuti addresses implicitly the Stalin of his Russian title as the gardener Marxist, whom he identifies as the leader of the Leninists. The text then enjoins the young the young uh, readers to follow the wise gardener's example and quotes, cut off the deceased branches and cut down the trunks ruthlessly. And uh, using for ruthlessly in the Russian translation, bispashadi, another commonplace of Persh rhetoric. Even making allowances for the fact that my source is in translation, clearly the probable context for this poem is the expulsion of Trotsky to Turkey in 1929 and the su suppression of his followers. The garden was a favorite theme of classical Persian poetry, a symbol of divine beauty. And the gardener stood in, metaphorically in poems by, um, by Rumi and Hafez and others, but the archetypal gardener, God. Vineyards found less commonly in Persian verse were a feature of Talon's native Georgia. Though so then this poem, like many other, uh, others of Lati in, in his Soviet years, can be seen as a grafting of Persian poetic conventions onto Stalinist uh, vines, it took root and the metaphor of Stalin as gardener became a common trope of the cult of personality. This skillfully written parable, if one, if, if one was an odious message, surely contributed to, to Tauti's Lahuti's becoming one of Stalin's favorite writers, certainly did not prevent his, his elevation to the heights of the Soviet military establishment. So Lahuti was, was in, now in a position to determine the Persian traditions, uh, that the term Persian tradition play a role in the emerging Tajik literature, 
he did, he did adjust his take on this tradition in the light of new policies promulgated at the Writers' Union Congress. In his addresses to the Congress, Gorky had stipulated that a major role in the new Soviet literature should be played by what he called the folklore of the tolling people, or more specifically, the ancient folk tales, tales, myths, and legends, their oral creations. Gorky somewhat casually and anachronistically aligned folklore with the tasks of, of a modern proletarian Soviet literature by claiming that folklore had been created by, quotes, ancient workers that reflects their striving to lighten their labor, to increase their productivity. Gorky, in his closing speech to the Congress, called on the writers assembled to, quotes, collect your folklore, learn from it. And so they did. The Communist Party took up folklore in a big way. Starting in 1934 to 35, on the initiative of party officials as highly placed as Lazar Kakanovich, a political leader, large scale collection of folklore proceeded apace in the Russian regions. In the republics, accordingly, the party hierarchy also became involved in the production and sorry, the promotion and dissemination of their folklore, an activity which was now overseen by the first secretary of each republic. Folklore centers were founded in, in each republic and then the branches uh, of the Academy of Sciences, special sections were set up dedicated to the study and translation of local folklore. In the 1930s, Lakuchi adjusted to this new officially sponsored trend, but somewhat casuistically drew his Soviet verse on, his, on the Persian age tradition of high literature, but at the same time claimed for it a folkloric identity. Having made this adjustment, he was constantly advanced as an example of the writer who, in the words of the Ford, uh, to a 1937 collection of his, of his poems, quotes, combined in his creative work, Bolshevik content with a distinctive national form. That is to say, met the stipulations of Stalin in his 1925 speech. His uh, Lahuji's verse of the 1930s adheres to this formula, but provides the Stalinist formula provides its own understanding of national in form. The Soviet socialist content was predictable. Production heroes, Soviet leaders, uh, 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 secret police uh, personnel, border guards, and the miners of the Donbass and Ukraine, plus the image of the capital city Moscow as metropole, and so forth. He also frequently included in his poetry, often as a central theme, material drawn from his revolutionary past in Iran, especially the martyred com comrades from the Tabriz uprising. For national form, Lahuti drew on the Persian trussel tradition. As was his poem, The Garden, he contrived to interpolate into his treatment of Soviet themes, imagery and symbolic motifs from classical Persian poetry, familiar to many Tajiks because of a, of a common Persianate culture, nightingales, roses, knights, and Persian warriors. He was not alone in adopting the strategy, but more accomplished in implementing it than, than others and more attuned to the subtleties of the tradition. Actually, however, the kind of text promoted in the republics during the 1930s as folklore diverged significantly from Gorky's stipulations at the 1934 Congress. In his addresses there, Gorky had drawn a valorized distinction between folklore as, quotes, ancient folk tales, myths and legends, and, quotes, the epic and the chivalric romance, which he condemned as, quotes, creations of the feudal aristocracy. But in practice, in official sources and criticism, the national epics of the minority peoples were paid much more attention than the other genres of traditional folklore. Millions of rubles were give, spent by the government on, on teams of translators and scholars who worked on them. And Soviet officialdom, however, wavered in their reception of the epics, now banning certain epics as feudal, somewhat in the Gorkian vein, but now extolling them as masterpieces of, quote, world literature, whose greatness conferred glory on the country as a whole. Unlike Gorky, they de facto favored and authored written epics over the oral. He had, as I mentioned, privileged the oral in folklore. Luckily for Lohiti was his attachment to Shanamei. Lohiti began to identify his writing with Shanamei, especially after the lavish celebration of their thousandth anniversary of Ferdowsi's birth in 1934. He liked to point out that it was a, that it was a beloved text, not just of the Persian age Tajikistan, but of all Central Asia. However, he changed his account of his own relationship to this epic in keeping with the times. Though in his speech at the Congress, he had cited as exemplars of Central, for Central Asian literature, figures from the classical written tradition of Persia. Following Gorky's speech, he began to recall 
that he had become captivated by Chandamay when he heard it, first heard it from wandering bards. That is, in other words, implying an identification with the popular oral law. Prominent among his new poetry of the 1990s were the twin uh, poems explicitly based on Chandamay, Crown and ba Banner, the text of which Lahuti presented to, to Stalin at a Kremlin reception of December 19, the 4th, 1935, a high point in his career. The reception was to honor collective farm workers from Tajikistan and, and Turkmenistan who had reached uh, record levels in their cotton production. The poems written in the meter of Nishaname comprised two sections, Crown, a translation of a passage from the epic, and Banner, which extends the epic's uh, timeline into the modern day, cotton producing Tajikistan. In the closing lines of Crown, Lahuti draws its, a contrast between the world of Shaname, where Iranians are pitted against the Turanians, and the, and the present, when the various ethnic groups are at peace and there's prosperity for all. The year 1935 marks the, the pinnacle of Lahuti's Soviet career, which went into decline with the so called friendship campaign of 1935 to 1938, instituted by Stalin in highly visible Kremlin receptions. Stalin's speeches at, in these years and other authoritative forces emphasized the importance of vernacular distinctiveness. In a twist on national in form, each republic was to have its own national forms and its own specific and unique people's poet, an analog to Pushkin, the national poet of Russia. But there was to be just one national epic for each. In consequence, for example, though before the revolution, tales from Shanamei had been staged as operas in Azerbaijan, another area where Persian culture had, had historically been important. In the 1930s, the Azerbaijanis were prohibited from staging them. Their poet was Nisami. It was at this time that officials in the Central Asian Republics began to promote the absolutely non-Indigenous genre of the opera. Starting in the mid-1930s, national republics were set the task of building an opera house and creating a repertoire for them. Each republic was required to provide at least one all-sung large-scale opera by the end of the 1930s. The rationale for this project was, as the musicologist Theodore Levin has put it, quotes, the cultures, the cultures of non-Russians living on Soviet territory could progress in the social sense only by assimilation or adoption of Russian or more broadly speaking, European models. Moscow bureaucrats believed they could give ethnic minorities of Central Asia a jumpstart in cultural modernization by creating operas to Soviet officialdom, the highest form of music. But the new operas would be based on tales from their own culture, let's say from the culture of, of um, native to the um, republics. In practice, almost invariably, the jewel of each republic's new opera repertoire was based on a story taken from an epic, one of their epics in its national tradition. For these operas, Central Asian folk tunes were assiduously collected by composers as they had been by European romantics of the previous century. So in this instance, the folk tunes were given updated ideologically laden texts and their monophonic melodies were thrust into non-indigenous poly polyphonic arrangements. Lahuti participated in this program and in the late 1930s, he wrote the libretto for the second original opera in Tajik, Kave the, the Blacksmith. It was based on the Kave story from Shanane. The opera was given a one day Moscow premiere at the Bolshoi on April the 15th, 1941, as part of a festival of Tajik culture, assiduously attended by Stalin and his Politburo entourage. Lohuti's libretto bears the marks of this time. It was written not at the time of the, of the Writers' Congress or the Shanamei celebrations, but at the end of the 30s, in what was already a different historical moment, a time when the folk things became things folk became popular in Russian, Narodnaya. And that was, a, and Narodnaya was a mantra of the cultural platform. In Shanamei itself, the Kaveh story takes up but a small part of the huge epic, which with, with its some 50,000 couplets is the world's largest, longest epic poem written by a single author and seven times the length of Homer's Iliad. But as most of you probably know, Though Kave, the story appeared in the early myth-based sections of Shanami, it is disproportionately significant because it plays played a key role in, in contested accounts of Iranian national identity. Kave himself has served as an emblematic figure for, for disparate political groups, both in Persia and in exile. 
communities, especially in the 20th century. For example, during the constitutional revolution of the 1960 and 908, enthusiasts took Kaveh as their emblem, and when driven into exile, they named their periodical Kava, which ran from 1916 to 1922. At the same time, Kaveh had, uh, had been co-opted as the emblem of the revolution in Golan, where it was adopted for their posters and even their stamps. And in the 1930s, Reza Shah Pahlavi compensated for the questionable legitimacy of his rule, given that he was originally just an army officer, by having statues, murals, and mosaics installed all over Iran celebrating Shahnameh and Ferdowsi. We are then looking at a text with different appropriations interpretations. Moreover, it resonated over a broad area encompassing Central Asia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, as well as Persia. Lahuti's choosing to focus on the uh, Kaveh's story out of all the characters and episodes in, the, in Shanameh provides a happy confluence of the Persianate literary tradition and Bolshevik rhetoric, enabling a central narrative of the Persians to be co-opted in the service of the new revolutionary culture. In the early Soviet years, uh, not Kaveh per se, but the figure of the blacksmith became a stock figure on posters and propagandistic bursts of, of the Soviet Union. Not irrelevant perhaps to Lahuti's opera, Kaveh's name was often rendered in Soviet text as Kova, uh, uh, as it was in the title of his opera, Kuznetskova. And the words uh, Kovka and Kavats, having to do with forging, that's to say with the activity of the blacksmith, was central to Soviet rhetoric about the new man, about how the new man would be created. Before commenting on Lahuti's opera, I will, for the benefit of those of you who are not familiar with the Kaveh story, as it appears in Shalomé, now provide a brief summary. Apologies to those who are familiar. There are several versions of the Kaveh story, but in the Shalomé version, a wicked King Zahak of Arab origin has usurped the Persian throne and killed the rightful Shah. The Shah's widow has taken their son, Feridun, legitimate heir, into the mountains to save him from Zahak. In the meantime, Zahak has instituted a despotic and cruel regime. Reign. He is further discredited by, as a ruler by his links with the devil, to be seen in particular in two aggressive servants growing out of his shoulders who need to be fed human brains in order to be pacified. So Huck has been feeding them the brains of youth. 11 of the 12 sons of Kaveh have perished in this way, and the 12th is now being threatened. Zahak assembles notables, demanding that they sign a document endorsing his reign as, just, as the just one. They acquiesce, but Kaveh barges into the court and refuses to sign, declaring, quotes, I will never sign or give a thought to this corrupted tyrant in his court. When Kaveh leaves, a crowd gathers around him in the marketplace. He continues to, to shout his demands for justice and hoists his leather blacksmith's apron as a rallying point. A new army of men forms around him and he leads them to Feridun's encampment. When Feridun sees the leader's the leather apron, he drapes it in, in roomy brocade and adorns it with a device of jewels on, on the ground of gold and, and makes fringes for it of crimson, yellow, and purple. At the top, he puts a spear and places uh, a splendid globe like, uh, like the moon. He calls the apron the Kavian banner, and from this time forward, any man who assumes power and places, uh, 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 places the royal crown on, on his head would add your new jewels to it. Feridun proceeds to do battle with Zahak, in, in, is victorious and ascends the throne as the rightful heir. For the rest of the epic, Shaname, Kaveh, Kaveh fades from view, though his, though his sons figure in the subsequent episodes as valiant knights and military leaders. Lahuti, in his account of how he wrote the liberator for this opera, claimed that he followed the conventions for the oral epic in, as he put it, quotes, allowing myself to improvise freely. He improvised, he said, because he, he strove to, quotes, produce an opera on a level worthy of a Soviet bard. In other words, he placed Yanome in the vernacular oral tradition rather than the written. Thereby, he implicitly laid claim to his own mastery of it, when in fact, his ticket to prominence in Soviet literature had initially been his mastery of the Persian written tradition. In several respects, Lahuti's opera bears the remarks of the late 1930s moment in which it was composed. For example, uh, uh, Lahuti accorded the folk um, 
a mentor, uh, the Ndrodne, a mentor of the late 19th century, greater promise in the story of Cave than they enjoyed in Ferdowsi's version. He foregrounded several folk characters, in particular a cunning cook, um, his, his daughter and advisor, and, and, and the sons of Cave, Varun and Farouk, and their long suffering mother, Piruz. Also, in the opera, Cave does not go alone to the court to confront the usurper Shah, Zahak. Rather, he, but he tries to barge in at the head of a mob of rebellious commoners, but is forced to enter the palace alone because his fellow protection, protesters are not allowed in. Moreover, the rebels are able to thwart this king because Kubert, an example of, of, the, of then modish topics of the crafty man of the folk, wheedles his way into palace employ as a cook. There, he secretly saves the youths marked as victims by hiding them in his quarters and surreptitiously substituting sheep's brains for human brains. Um, in the finale, there's no sign of Kaveh handing power over to Feridun as in, as in Chaname. Rather, all the characters break out into dance and song, the lines including, quotes, glory be to the brave warriors who resolve to rise up and drive out the evil host. In other words, we have a version of a common finale of rhetoric of theatrical and filmic texts of the Stars 1930s, such as the finale of Grigory Alexandrov's popular musical film, Volga Volga, from about the same time, 1938, and actually Stalin's favorite film. In the opera finale, there is a song uh, and dance sequence in which a troupe from the, from the provinces sing a song about, correction, in the, in the film finale, there's a, a song and dance sequence in which a troop from the provinces sing a song about the need to use a, quote, a broom to sweep out undesirable elements, in other words, to purge. La Houdi's opera is then suffused with the distinctive mentality of the second half of the 1930s. Its characters are obsessed with securing the borders, military preparedness, and remaining steadfastly loyal to their native land. Cave is presented as a quasi mystic figure but mostly in terms of his extraordinary physical prowess and facility for rapid production. He is, in other words, a version of the Sakhanovite, the allegedly titanic worker propelled to fame in the Soviet media of the late 1935. Critics viewed the libretto with purged time eyes also. One reviewer, Igrosheva, for example, finds that with faults finds fault with Lahuti's depiction of the negative characters in the opera as, quotes, too meager. The story of the adaptation of Shanamei for Soviet Tajikistan problematizes the whole question of national and form and socialist in content. For a start, advancing the opera as a genre that, that could promote cultural modernization suggests that form could have a determining impact on the consciousness rather than content, as might have been expected. In the course of of importing Western musical modes in the 1930s, especially 1936, Western composers were assigned to Central Asian republics to write the music for operas, symphonies, and so forth for the populace. Balasanyan, the composer for Kaveh the Blacksmith, was of Armenian descent, but from Turkmenistan and Russian trained. He moved to Southern only in 1936 for the, uh, and became the leading Tajik composer. This was his second Tajik opera. We used Tajik folk and classical melodies in producing quotes, two arias, recitatives, and so forth. Thereby, as it was put in the introduction to the, to the libretto, quotes, appropriating the experience of world art and of Russian art in the first instance, the primus inter pares of world culture. The cause of the case of this opera also throws into relief my point that the binary form content is problematical. The extra textual framing of both the form and the content of a particular work is crucial. This point is illustrated in the battles of the late 1930s and 1940s over whether Shanamei as a feeder text for the new Tajik culture belongs to the Persian tradition, the Tajik, or the Irano Tajik. Some commentators from the time even laid claim to some Russian ownership of it by pointing to the translation of, by Zhukovsky in the early 18th, 19th century or emphasized a pan-Soviet context, given that the versions are to be found in the traditions of Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia. Arguments over the prominence, providence of Shanamei became central to the major debate 
of the late 1930s and 1940s about tragic identity, which proved faithful for Lahuti. Though works like his opera went under the rubric Friendship of Peoples, it was actually not self-evident who the Tajik people were and what Tajikistan represented. Tajikistan had not, as such, existed as a separate geopolitical entity before it was created as the Tajik Autonomous Socialist Republic within Uzbekistan in 1924. Scholars argued about the identity of the Tajiks. Were they a separate ethnic group or, or the speakers of a particular form of Farsi, or were they those who resided within the new republic's borders? The Orientalist Vivi Bartolt, whose distinguished career straddles the revolution, had argued that their identity was fluid and the successive moments historically conditioned, but those particular uh, contentions of Bartolt were ignored in these later years. In the late 1930s, and especially in the 1940s, Lahuti fell victim to the resurgence of Tajik nationalism that sought to claim priority for Tajikistan in the Persianate literary tradition and a Tajik provenance for Shahnameh. During the festival of Tajik culture in 1941, when Kaveh the blacksmith was performed in Moscow, Stalin at a reception called the Tajiks, quotes, the oldest of peoples of Central Asia whose intelligentsia gave birth to the great poet Ferdowsi. Within Tajikistan, the leaning proponent of this position was Lahuti's powerful nemesis, um, Babajan Gafurov, a Tajik, who from 1941 to 1944 served as Secretary, Secretary for Propaganda for the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Tajikistan, then from 44 to 46 as Second Secretary of, of the party, and from 46 to 4056 as the First Secretary. He, and incidentally, is now a revered cultural icon of post independence Tajikistan. Gafurov, citing Bartold, contended that the Tajik areas of Central Asia were the original cradle of Persianate tradition. He further claimed that, quotes, it was the various peoples of Iran who had absorbed the creative work of the central, peoples of Central Asia and not the other way around, arguing that the writers typically considered Persian, such as Ferdowsi, should be more accurately described as Persian Tajik. By the late 1930s, commentary haters were categorizing Shahnameh not, not, not as Persian or Iranian, but as Tajik. Lahuti, who persisted in claiming a Persian identity for Fordis's epic, was accused of openly identifying himself as Iranian and giving uh, Iran more than, uh, sorry, and loving Iran more than Tajikistan. Gafurov tried to have him expelled from the Communist Party in 1943, and when these efforts failed, he spread libelous rumors about him. He forbade publication of Lahuti, demanded that the intelligentsia of Tajikistan not associate with him, and instructed Tajik performers not to stage any of Lahuti's works. By the late 1940s, Lahuti, with his promotion of Persian literature, fell afoul of, so of the so-called anti-cosmopolitan campaign, and he feared arrest. His situation was not helped by the fact that his wife was Jewish, the ethnic, the ethnic group most in that campaign's sites. Loti was not arrested, however. Realpolitik brought him two partial reprieves. Firstly, after Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, in September, the country launched an Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran and forced the Shah to abdicate. In a subsequent cultural offensive, the Soviet Union made use of Tajik writers given the closeness of their language to Farsi. In the 1930s, Lahuti had translated Pushkin into Tajik. Now he began translating Pushkin, Mayakovsky, and other Russian writers into Farsi. Also, when Pahlavi was out of power in Iran, Lahuti's works were promoted there, especially by uh, um, Abdullah Hossein Nushin, Nushin a Syed theater activist and founding member of the leftist Iranian party today. For the first party meeting, Nushin prepared polit brief political sketches and recitals of Lahuti Lahuti's revolutionary poems. And when he subsequently worked on theatrical reform, he trained his students in part with recitations of Lahuti's works. The Soviet partial occupation of Iran ended in May 1946, and with it the reprieve in Lahuti's blacklisting in the Soviet Union. During the ensuing what, uh, time of troubles, as Lahuti's wife put it, when he was unable to publish and in constant fear of arrest, the couple decided to translate Shahnameh themselves as a gesture in support of Persian culture. 
This endeavor helped to sustain them not morally, and Lohuti told her that though it might well prove impossible to ever publish their translation, what mattered was that what they were doing it, that they were doing it. The complete multi-volume translation of the epic rendered in verse was despite the odds published, published by the Academy of Sciences in 1957, at, between 1957 and 1989. Though Lahiti himself had died in 1957, before, unfortunately before, just before the first volume appeared. As it was, they managed to get the first volume published only as a result of what they called a miracle. Now, Nehru was, when visiting in 1955, visiting the Soviet Union in 1955, expressed surprise that the Mahabharata and Salome had no Russian translation. And the Soviet leadership, now embroiled in an extension of the Cold War to the global south, quickly rectified that with Lahuti's ready-made translation. In the example of Lahuti, then, we have not just a co poet, but a writer who is wedded to his own aesthetic and sense of cultural history, ultimately to the detriment of his own career. One would probably have to concede that he made some inevitable concessions to the political realities of Stalin's time, but not to all. Despite the political pressures, he remained steadfastly committed to the cause of Persian poetry and culture and to its continuing to play a formative role in Central Asia. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Katie, for this um, captivating talk. Um, we have a few questions from uh, members of the audience that um, I'd like to ask you. And um, I, I also have a, a, a couple of questions that I'll see if I can squeeze them in. All right, mm -hmm. so um, let, me, uh, let me read these uh, questions to you and I may adapt them a little bit. Um, so the first question that I'm seeing, um, and that actually is one that I had also sort of wanted to ask you is, how did you first become interested in Lahuti and Persian poetry? And what about Soviet Russia is it that had that interested you um, in this subject? And um, if I may tag on something I had wanted to ask you is, is you have broadened in this book that you just published your, your, your geo-cultural uh, focus quite a bit. And um, I guess I would also like to know how has that affected your, your view of Soviet culture, um, on which of course you had written quite a bit before, but what kind of a difference has it made? Um, had I become interested in Lahuti? Well, actually, originally, I became interested in Lahuti uh, uh, through the uh, Russian ex experimental poet, uh, uh, Belovey Khlebnikov, uh, who, who wrote a, a quite a bit of poetry when he was uh, serving with the Soviet forces, uh, in uh, serving, serving as a propagandist in, with the Soviet forces in Iran in 1921-22. And um, he had written a poem called Kaveh the Blacksmith. And I became interested in pursuing uh, uh, this poem, uh, in which, which, which opened up uh, uh, the example of, of Lahuti. Um, and and um, I followed Lahuti into Tajikistan. I had not intended to include Central Asia in my book, but, uh, but in following the Lahuti, I ended up in Tajikistan. So, how has this affected my view of Soviet culture? Well, I think I think I'm not alone. I think this, the profession in general, the, the 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 Slavic profession in general, has has expanded its purview uh, quite radically in recent years. And many of our graduate students are working on on topics having to do with with non-Russian areas of the Soviet, the of the former Soviet Union. Um, so that I see myself as part of that general trend. Okay. There are two questions concerned with uh, La Houthi's wife and her influence and background. Um, so one question is, uh, what do you know about her role and influence on the poet's career? And another one asking whether it is true that she translated Shonome to Russian, or that, that, that La Houthi translated Shonome uh, to Russian with the help of his wife. Well, his wife, his wife uh, Cecilia Banu, was, was, in, was in fact a, uh, an expert on, on Persian literature. Um, and she, she translated the, the absolute majority of, of uh, Lahuti's poems, which were, which were originally written in, in Persian or, or, in, or in Tajiki, uh, into Russian. Um, some, sometimes the poems are translated by other people, but she translated the absolute majority of them. 
And so it was it was it was natural that they that the that the translation of Shanami itself was a collaboration of husband and wife. Translation into Russian was a collaboration of husband and wife. Mm -hmm. Another question is, do you think that Lahuti saw himself as an Iranian in exile in the Soviet Union, or did he consider himself more like a Soviet with an Iranian background? That's a tough question. <laughs> it's, it's difficult, it's difficult to, 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 to decide that, actually, I would say. But certainly, he, 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 certainly he, he remained loyal to, 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 to things Persian throughout his life. That can be said. Um, uh, and he was unable to return to, to Persia much as he would have loved to do that. He was unable to, to visit. Um, uh, so uh, I, I would tend to think that he saw him, it, well, I think he would probably have defined himself more broadly than, than as, a, as a citizen of Tajikistan. And in fact, very early on, in, even already in 1930, he shifted his prime principal residence from, from Tajikistan to Moscow. And he was accommodated in the, the uh, very soon thereafter in the elite housing of the, what was called the House on the Embankment, uh, uh, dialing opposite the, the Kremlin. Uh, so, and he lived there for most of the 1930s and, and 40s. So, so he was, he, in terms of his identification with, with Tajikistan specifically, I think that, that weakened over time. Um, but, but, he may, but, but he did see himself to some extent as Soviet. Uh, in 1935, he attended the Paris Congress for the Defense of Culture, this big international talk fest of anti-fascists, um, as one of the few Soviet delegates to the conference. And when he returned, he, 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 um, he wrote a poem in which he, uh, which expressed a lot of um, anti-Western anti sentiment, but also, uh, also uh, criticized contemporary Persia, um, and saw and 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 established established the Soviet Union as as superior in a, in a hierarchy of country, countries over Persia. Now, of course, this this was over over so to speak bourgeois Persia, but nevertheless, I think that 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 indicates um, a continuing drift of in, in self identification to the Soviet. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is whether you think that Lahuti's influence um, on Soviet literature is limited to content. We know that Lahuti, this, uh, this writer asks, um, we know that Lahuti experimented with the formal aspects of traditional poetry and that he is considered one of the first poets who composed Persian poetry in freer poetic forms. Um, so this person is wondering if we can trace any specific formal feature of Russian poetry in Lahuti's Persian works, with reference to things such as poetic forms, rhyme arrangements, or rhythms, as far as you know. Uh, I think, I think I'm think i afraid you've lost me at this point. I, I can't comment on his Persian poets, as I mentioned. I'm just simply not an expert. Right. Okay. But 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 he but he but he, but he but he was in his in his uh, uh, in his Soviet poems he he was he definitely he de he he was not merely a traditionalist he did did experiment particularly in the nineteen thirties he did experiment conduct formal experiments and right. there, there were di different language levels and so forth um, in his poems of that period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, and I see that Ali Reza has come back on. So I think that means that we're about up with the time. So we, we may have to cut it short here. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have reached the end of the program. And I have to thank everyone who joined us today from all over the world. And special thanks to Dr. Afari, Dr. Speaker, and of course, Dr. Clark for today's presentation. It was very uh, informative and I personally learned a lot on uh, the poet uh, Lahuti. Thank you again to the, all the speakers, especially Dr. Clark. And uh, we bid you a farewell for now. Have a great day. I just wanted to say that the one in the chat that says, why was Iran, uh, sorry, why was, is Iran incorrectly referred to as Persia? Well, in fact, it became Iran in 1935. It was, it, before then it was called Persia. And, I'm, and, and I was, I've been careful to call, to call the country Persia in the, in, in, uh, before 1935.
Thank you so much for that clarification. That's always something that comes up and uh, there's always a discussion about that. So I'm glad to have that clarified by you. Uh, we thank you again, Dr. Clark, uh, Dr. Speaker, and we look forward uh, to hopefully seeing you in person soon. Thank bye -bye. you very much. Bye-bye.